Welcome, thank you for coming. This is the last Illuminations lecture of the semester. Um, we're very uh, fortunate to have uh, Dr. John Duvall here, um, who is the Margaret Church Distinguished Professor of English, which is a nice connection and way to round off the year as uh, Dr. Margaret Church was a uh, key to forming the philosophy and literature program um, her book, Time and Reality. It's a pretty good um, example of what uh, philosophy is. What? <laughs> and this pretty good. Can do. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pretty good book. It's a good example of what philosophy can, and literature can do. There was a line break there. But it's, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, very good. Um, so anyway, <laughs> uh, without further ado, uh, I'll introduce Dr. John Duvall, um, whose work includes um, race and white identity in Southern fiction, Don DeLillo's Underworld. The Identifying Fictions of Toni Morrison, Modernist Authenticity and Postmodern uh, post Blackness, and Faulkner's Marginal Couple, Invisible Outlaw, and Unspeakable Communities. He's also the editor of Modern Fiction Studies, um, and one of his most recent projects is a book on uh, post-9-11 uh, fiction that came out of Modern Fiction Studies called uh, Narrating 9-11. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. John Paul. But um, I want to thank Donovan very much for asking me to uh, come and speak to you today. Thank all of you for coming at a very busy time of the semester. I, I, I did at least get Donovan to move it from last week when I said the problem would be I would be uh, opposite Zadie Smith. So, <laughs> um, well, because of his role in planning the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is often referred to as the architect of 9-11. Today, however, we will shift this designation from the figurative to the literal by considering one of the terrorists who really was the architect of 9-11. But it's going to take us just a little while to get here. Uh, so my talk today is representing the enemy of her, Jared Kovacs Aha, Postmodern Narrative and the Architectural Unconscious. So until recently, I would have said that the best novel of 9-11 that no one was writing about was Jess Walters, The Zero, published in 2006. However, in light of some recent work on this novel, I believe that the, uh, this dubious distinction now falls to uh, Kovacs Aha, which appeared in 2011. Like Walter's novel, Kovex challenges what has become the orthodox position in discussions of 9-11 fiction, namely that American fiction, and Western fiction more broadly, fails to adequately consider the Islamic other. Kind of okay. Do you want to move to the side a little bit? Uh, do you want me to move to the Maybe if you move towards the monitor, that way you can move. Actually, uh, this does. It was there. It was there. Uh, but you know what? It doesn't actually need to be there until my page 16. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, what a long, strange trip it will be. <laughs> um, and I, I can make it come on. Oh, yeah, all you have to do is hit. Um, it, okay. Yeah. Okay. I should do oh, well, you know, just something to look at while. <laughs> Got too excrementally boring, at least have something to look at. Um, the, um, so this, this particular view that, that says uh, that American fiction, Western fiction, fails to consider the Islamic other. Although the Indian novel uh, Pank, Pankaj Mishra was the first to articulate this view, Richard Gray has most thoroughly developed this position in his 2011 study, After the Fall of American Literature Since 9-11. For Gray, American fiction after 9-11 fails to depict the Islamic other, uh, the Islamic enemy other, particularly because of a tendency in this body of fiction to focus on domesticity. He identifies a broad array of American novelists from Jane McInerney, Reynolds Price, Claire Massoud to Don DeLillo, Jonathan Safran Poor, and Ken Kalthus, who missed the real trauma of the terrorist attack because they, quote, simply assimilate the unfamiliar to familiar domestic structures. The crisis is in every sense of the word domesticated. Well, on the face of it, 
Criticism that American nine fiction cannot imagine the other ought not preclude the possibilities of postmodern narration, and indeed might be construed as a call for precisely such work to counter un un unironized family feeling in contemporary realist fiction. But the solutions posed by those developing the domesticity thesis repeatedly fail to credit postmodern narrative possibilities. For Gray, the answer lies in an as yet unwritten fiction of 9-11 that would do for the terrorist attacks what realist multi-ethnic fiction from the late 1980s and 1990s did to reimagine the Vietnam War and the American South as a region. Michael Rothberg claims that we need a, quote, fiction of international relations and extraterritorial citizenship that he finds best exemplified in the lyric reason realism of Joseph O'Neill's Netherland. What is never called for is a ludic postmodern narration, one that blurs the boundary between the fictional and the real. That is unfortunate because the Bush administration's scripting of the global war on terror and the homeland security state already blurred that boundary, which suggests that postmodernism may be able to depict the post-9-11 geopolitical landscape and thus facilitate historical thinking far better than realism. To digress just a bit, the American security state, which comes into existence early in the Cold War with the National Security Act establishing the CIA in 1947, is just the beginning of what would become, as Timothy Malley points out, uh, quote, the astonishing growth of clandestine institutions since World War II, but it has produced a qualitative change in the structure of public knowledge about US foreign affairs and forms a significant barrier to forms of public knowledge. Well, if the growth of secret agency was crucial, uh, a crucial feature of the post-World War II period, it's even more pronounced following 9-11. Uh, today, according to the Washington Post, there are 1,271 government organizations and 1,931 private companies working on programs related to counterterrorism, homeland security, and intelligence in the United States. So that the CIA, NSB, NSA, DIA, INR, NGA, and NRO merely float on the surface of the alphabet soup of agency acronyms. In such a world where we all know of the existence of secret agencies, we know that we really don't know all that's being done in our names and suspect that we really don't want to know. This is why post 9-11 narrative matters by imagining individual and political agency, contemporary narratives, and for me, particularly those postmodern narratives, map the fantasies that mediate the everyday experience of empire and at curious moments extend invitations for us to think historically. If the feared other is not a nation state as the Soviet Union was during the Cold War, but rather the deterritorialized concept of terror, is it possible outside of fiction to ever imagine alternatives current instantiation of the national security state or to official stories of the motives of terrorists. Well, that was back to, so back to the Richard Gray and the do domesticity thesis. A counterexample to Gray's claim that neither of the fiction has failed to consider the other appears in just Walter's The Zero through a symp sympathetic representation of an intellectual secular Muslim, an informant in a terrorist cell who becomes an unlikely suicide bomber when he is betrayed by the agency that hired him. But even in Walter's novel, this other of 9-11, although an articulate critic of American exceptionalism and consumerism, still serves as a somewhat marginal figure uh, in relation to the white male perspective that controls the angle of vision. Uh, I, I want to focus today instead on Kobeck's nuanced postmodern rendering of the man known in the West as Mohammed Abe, a leader in the 9-11 terrorist plot, a man many see as evil incarnate. But first, I take up two limited portrayals of Aja by Don DeLillo and Martin Amos that better help us understand what Kobeck has accomplished. The two truncated depictions of the terrorist initially seem to pose a challenge to someone wishing to argue for the political efficacy of postmodernism inasmuch as DeLillo and Amos are frequently categorized with the postmodern. Adam makes a cameo in DeLillo's Falling Man but plays a central role in Amos' short story, The Last Days of Muhammad Adam. However, Amos' at times slapstick portrayal of Adam gets no closer to an understanding of Islamic terrorism than Delilo's all too brief representation. If Delilo's Atta is paper thin, Amos' is but the butt of a joke, a 
clown beset by bodily woes and consigned to hell. It is curious that Delilo produces such a dehistoricized portrait of Anna, since Delilo has previously exemplified how postmodern narrative can facilitate historical thinking in such novels as Libra in 1987, his examination of Lee Harvey Oswald's role in the Kennedy assassination, and his massive 1997 novel Underworld, which is a sweeping history of the Cold War. Strangely, when Delilo and Amos try to imagine terrorist motivation, they seem to forget the postmodernism with which they are associated and to work more within realist modes of representation and really to offer no invitation to think historically. Delilo's main char uh, terrorist uh, character uh, is a character called Hamad, who is not as ideologically committed to the cause as some of the other cell members, but Hamad is tutored by Mohammed Adam who is described in the novel, quote, intense, a small, wiry man who spoke, spoke to Ahmad in his face. He was very genius, others said, and he told them that a man could stay forever in a room doing blueprints, eating and sleeping, even praying, even plotting, but at a certain point he has to get out. Even if the room is a place of prayer, he can't stay there all his life. Islam is the world outside the prayer room, as well as the, the surahs in the Quran. Islam is the struggle against the enemy, near, enemy, and far. Jews first, well, for all things unjust and hateful, and then the Americans. Delilah's Atta is someone whose, quote, mind was in the upper skies, making sense of things, drawing things together. Well, this is precisely the first problem. Delilah's Atta is all mind and no body. As such, Atta serves as a foil to Hamad who has sexual desires and doubts about their mission. Delillo can only begin to imagine the motives for terrorism through his German character, Ernst Hector, who may have had ties to the radical uh, Bader Meinhof group which committed terrorist acts in West Germany in the 1970s. But even if er Ernst articulates a rationale for 9-11 that casts it less as a matter of Islamic fundamentalism uh, that issues of politics and economics, Delilo himself seems to encode his recognition of the imaginative shortcoming of having a European character articulate Al-Qaeda's theoretical basis for 9-11. As Ernst exits the novel, another character realizes, realizes that whatever she learned about terrorism from him is limited by the fact that he is, quote, one of ours, which meant godless, Western, and white. However truncated, uh, Delillo's treatment of Atta and the other 9-11 terrorists is, it is certainly more nuanced than the one that uh, what finds in Martin Amos's short story, The Last Days of Mohammed Atta. If nothing else, this story conclusively proves that one not, need not be an American to fail to convincingly imagine the Islamic other. The occasion for the story is ostensibly provided by the epigraph from the 9-11 Commission report that asserts that, quote, no physical documentary or analytical evidence provides a convincing explanation of why Otta drives from Boston to Portland, Maine on September 10th, only to return on the morning of September 11th. The implication, then, is that Amos's story will provide the missing explanation. But the way Otta's morning unfolds, rather than shedding light on terrorist motives, uh, focuses our attention on a series of humiliations of the flesh. Things go from bad to worse quickly. Atta slips and falls on his tailbone in the shower. He suffers from acute constipation as he sits on the toilet. He cuts both his lips and nose while shaving. And when he does have an urgent need to move his bowels, the doors to the plane's lavatories are locked prior to takeoff. Amos does finally imagine a reason for Atta's trip to Portland. Atta goes to see an imam who will give him a bottle of liquid, which might be holy water or possibly a drug, to take before crashing the plane. Foreshadowing the end of the story, Ada asks the imam about the prophet's prohibition against suicide, which warns that those who commit suicide will experience in hell the same torments that they use to end their lives. The imam tells Atta that America's crimes exempt him from the prohibition against suicide. For Amos, Atta is a self-hating fundamentalist with no real faith, except a belief in death, which turns out to be his clearest sense of mission. This is from a uh, short story. Quote, the core reason was, of course, all the killing. 
all the putting to death, not the crew, not the passengers, not the office workers in the Twin Towers, not the cleaners and the caterers, not the men of the NYPD and the FDNY. He was thinking of the wars, the wars and the war cycles that would flow from this day. He didn't believe in the devil as an active force, but he did believe in death. Killing was divine delight, and your suicide was just part of the contribution you made, the massive contribution to death. In this passage, Atta is a caricature of the Western fantasy of the Islamic terrorist whose religion is reduced to orgiastic death cult. On the penultimate page, the story speculates on what it means to die instantly, arguing that even to be vaporized may take longer than one imagines. In this sense, the truest title of the story should probably be The Last Second of Muhammad Atta, the one from 846.40 to 846.41 a.m. on September 11, 2001, and I will quote at some length. The physical torment, the panic attack in every nerve, the riot of the atoms, merely italicized the last shinings of his brain. They weren't thoughts. They were more like a series of unignorable conclusions imposed from without. Here was the hereafter, after all, and here was the reckoning. His mind groaned and fumbled with the irreconcilability, a defeat, a self-cancellation. Could he assemble the argument? It follows, by definition, if and only if. And then the argument assembled all by itself. The joy of killing was proportional to the value of what was destroyed. But that value was something a killer could never see and never gauge. And where was the joy he thought he had felt? When was that joy, that itch, that paltry tingle? Yes, how bravely he had underestimated it. How very gravely he had underestimated, underestimated life. His own he had hated, and he had wished away. But see how long it was taking to absent itself. And with what helpless grief was he watching it go, imperturbable in its beauty and power, even as his flesh fried and his blood boiled. There was life kissing its fingertips. It's very hard to see how this could be read as anything other than Amos's articulation of a widespread Western desire for revenge that effectively says, I hope you died in full consciousness of excruciating agony and regret for your horrific act, you soulless killer. Well, the story consists of two parts, and part two has one and only one sentence. The one sentence of part two reproduces exactly the opening sentence of part one and reads as, follow, as follows. On September 11th, 2001, he opened his eyes at 4 a.m. in Portland, Maine, and Mohammed Atta's last day began. This repetition confirms the story as a Western revenge fantasy. Atta's last days are literally his last day, replayed over and over. Since the real Atta was evil, far from attaining paradise, the story fictively consigns him to hell which is precisely the hell of relief, reliving this mortifying day. Shower fall, constipation, depiliation, cut lip, fear, urgent need to move his bowels, and excruciating death and regret in perpetuity. This one sentence might be said to turn what had been a realist, a mean-spirited biographical sketch into a postmodern or perhaps magic realist text. But this gesture seems to be too little too late, as though it were the punchline to a story that we didn't find and now we're going to get to Jerry Kovac in a section I call Metafictional Biography in the Voices of Buildings. With a Muslim immigrant father and an Irish American mother, Jerry Kovac may be uniquely positioned to imagine the enemy other. Raised a Roman Catholic in Rhode Island, he admits that he spent his, quote, entire life enjoying the privilege and benefits of a male from middle-class white America because where he grew up had an elastic sense of whiteness. However, after 9-11, he became aware that there were two things America was obsessing about, Muslims and immigrants, which led to a revelation. Quote, holy shit, Fox News is talking about me. About half the people I talk with on a daily basis are Muslims and or immigrants. I've dated Muslim women. When you start hearing idiotic statements fil filtered through various media, it's just like, who the hell are these people talking about? This surely has nothing to do with my family or my friends. 
Kovacs' novel imagines the life and opinions of a man demonized by the US media and government as Muhammad Abba. One of the first challenges to the hegemonic American perception of this man is to insist that the eponymous character is identified by a known daguerre, a mask hiding a man known to his family and friends simply as Amir. Kovacs' complex portrait of Amir goes far beyond previous fictive uh, representations. Kovex of here may be an unstable anti semite with ties to Islamic fundamentalism, but the source of his paranoia is not religious per se. Instead, the context for understanding Amir's terrorist act is both aesthetic and intellectual, fully grounded in this middle class Egyptian graduate study, in this middle class Egyptian's graduate studies of architecture and urban planning in Germany. As such, we see Abba's terrorism in the context of his utopian desire for buildings and a cityscape that would foster organic community. His utopian vision and his insanity are two sides of the same sheet of paper. But for all its ludic excess, Atta, the novel, never lets us see the reader see here as anything less than the fully complex human animal. Kovacs' novel embodies a form of postmodern narrative that Linda Hutchin identified in the late 1980s as historiographic metafiction, narratives with self-conscious narrators and mixes of historical figures and fictional characters that create an epistemological questioning of the nature of historical knowledge. Although not as overtly metafictional as the, uh, that of the high postmodernists, the novel Atta nevertheless has crucial moments of metafictional imagination and metatextual construction that make it much more than an exercise of realism that so many 9-11 novels seem to be. Kovac insists that what he writes about is based on verifiable, verifiable fact. Quote, 90, 90, 90 to 95 percent of the book is true, but, it is, but the remainder is, quote, wildly untrue, opening ludic moment, moments of possibility. For example, it is known that Amir traveled to Pakistan to meet Osama bin Laden in November of 1999. It is also known that Osama bin Laden was skilled at volleyball and played it with his Mujahideen. In fact, one of uh, bin Laden's uh, lieutenants was a, a former professional volleyball player. Uh, Kovac imagines bin Laden inviting Ada to play two-man volleyball immediately after he's received his 9-11 assignment. As bin Laden and his teammate crush Amir and his partner in game after game, we hear bin Laden trash talk, and Amir become increasingly frustrated by his inability to compete. But the point is that a scene that initially seems to be entirely a pinchin-esque moment of comic excess is really not as groundless as it initially appears. The boundary between the factual and the wildly untrue blurs at such, such moments in the narrative. A little, little formalism here. The novel consists of 17 chapters that are numbered as a countdown. Until the final chapter, the titles of the first 16 are implied double, doubles. The word eight and the Arabic numeral eight. The word seven and the numeral seven, and so on. The first chapter of each pair is Amir's first person autobiography, beginning with early childhood memories and taking us through his graduate education in Germany and his increasing radicalization. The chapters with Arabic numerals form a third person account of the 9 11 plot from the time Amir, who the narrator of these chapters refers to by his American name, Ada, uh, when Amir lands on American soil. As is typical in so much historiographic metafiction, these paired Chapters represent a plot of the past and a plot of the fictional present, which eventually intersect. This intersection occurs in the 17th and final chapter, the word zero, where Amir's life story meets at the culmination of the 9-11 plot on the actual morning of the terrorist attacks. The chapter itself, however, conflates the title convention of alternating chapters in as much as the word zero in all caps contains within it the slash zero that differentiates the capital letter O from the numeral zero. Abba does not end, however, 
with the countdown to zero at America's ground zero. The final three pages appear to be an excerpt of Amir's master's thesis in city planning based on his research on the ancient Syrian city of Aleppo that he defended in August 1999 at the Technical University of Hamburg Harburg. And in point of fact, he had been admitted to the doctoral program in, in architecture. Although it is prefaced with what looks to be the authentic German title page of the thesis, it is Kovacs' creative approximation of a real document that no one is permitted to see. As Kovac notes in an interview, quote, the thesis exists, but it's locked in a drawer in his advisor's office. And the advisor won't let anyone see it because he's worried that Ada's father, a lawyer, might sue. There is some information in circulation about the thesis. We know that it's about the Syrian city of Aleppo and about the way that urban planners transformed the city for the worse by putting up western high rises and giant western highways. In the thesis, Ada proposes to replace modernist western architecture in Aleppo with what he termed, quote, the Islamic Oriental City. Well, now, some of the information in circulation of which Kovac speaks comes from the investigative journalism of Daniel Brook, who traveled to, to Hamburg and spoke with Amir's major professor, Dittmar McCuel, who appears as a character in Kovac's novel. Professor McCuel indeed fears that Amir's father, a retired lawyer, would, would sue if the thesis were published without the family's consent. McCule uh, walked Brooks through the thesis, at times translating a sentence or two. So now I'm going to quote from Brooks here briefly when he is, at times, quoting McCule, quoting Ada. Okay. So for Ada, the rebuilding of Aleppo's traditional cityscape was part of a larger project to restore the Islamic culture of the neighborhood, a culture he sees threatened by the West. Quoting now from Ada's thesis. The traditional structures of the society in all areas should be re-erected, Ada writes in his thesis, using architectural metaphors to describe his reactionary cultural project. In Ada's Aleppo, women wouldn't leave the house, and policies would be carefully crafted so as not to, quote, engender emancipatory thoughts of any kind, which he sees as, quote, out of place in Islamic society. So that's the extent of, of Ada's thesis that has, has leaked out into the world. Well, similarly, Kovacs' imagined thesis excerpt argues against modernist urban design overseen by, quote, clustered groups of men who believe in arcane organizational systems. Writing of the need uh, for Aleppo's organic growth, Mir sees the adaptation of Western notions of city planning as anathema. Now, I'm quoting Kovacs' imagined thesis. Quote, a form of human existence stands on the verge of a cataclysm as traumatic and damaging as any war. Family homes have been upended for the sake of multi-lane roads and high rises, destroying not only an entire fashion of existence, but also eradicating traditional virtues. Well, key here is the link between urban planning and war, both of which involve the destruction of existing buildings and certainly the radical disruption of communities. Amir's proposed solution Quote, calls for the destruction of modernity's imposition. We destroy the high rise and the multi-lane road. We replace them with souks, mosques, courtyard homes, and oddly shaped streets. The traditional structures of the society in all areas should be re-erected. In mounting this critique, Amir sounds like any number of critics of modernist city planning, such as Jane Jacobs in her classic 1961 study the death and life of great American cities. Um, Jacob similarly equates modernist architecture and city planning to war, complaining of low, middle, and luxury high-rise housing projects as well as failed cultural civic and commercial centers. Jacob decries, quote, expressways that eviscerate great cities. This is not the rebuilding of cities. This is the sacking of cities. But Amir is no buddy postmodernist. He decided that he does not want to open Aleppo to architecture that will ironically reference the past. Instead, he wants to restore the architectural past exactly as it was before the intrusion of the West. So, Kovacs' metafictional gesture, imagining the years factually indisputable authorship of an MA thesis 
by fictionally approximating an excerpt from that thesis as the coda to Amir's fictional autobiography. Well, that's of course instantiating the logic of the supplement. The thesis excerpt is presented as something extra, beyond the zero point of the terrorist act. At the same time, it reminds us of the incompleteness of what has come before, not only in Kovacs' telling, but also in other attempts to construe the man known as Mohammed Atta and the motives of the 9-11 terrorists. This supplemental text points us to what is so very different about Atta's treatment of Amir by reminding us of Amir's intellectual passion, the novel invites us to return to the narrative that precedes the thesis. In Kovacs telling, Amir's earliest childhood memory is of a family trip to Cairo to see the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx when Amir is five years old. This memory produces a rare feeling. The goodness of people overwhelms me. The individual common person joins with other common persons to build a timeless thing. This feeling is called into question by Amir's subsequent education, which teaches him that the pyramids, quote, function as engines of de devil worship, created by pantheistic decadent kings who enslaved their people. But this childhood memory is linked to another that reveals Amir's madness at the core of his obsession with architecture. This early childhood memory is immediately followed by Amir's direct address to the reader, one that interpolates the reader as Islamic, male, and quite possibly a member of the 9-11 terrorist cell. Brother, before going any further, you must do as I ask. If you fail, you forfeit any hope of true understanding. If you follow my instructions, you gain the world. The choice is yours. But look inside yourself, brother, and you will find Truly, there is no choice at all. Put down this book. Close your eyes. Wait for absolute silence. Listen. What is the sound beyond the silence? Do you hear it? Can you hear the hum? No. Listen again. Listen until you hear. Even as the text interpolates the reader and identifies Amir as the author of the book we read, but this, of course, is an impossible act of narration and authorship, because any such writing of the full story must be an after-the-fact telling, and Amir dies in the terrorist act, so there can be no retrospective telling. The reason Amir wants the reader to listen is so that they, too, can become aware of the subliminal humming noise that is ever and always with him, whether in small villages or great cities. If, if one thinks that the, quote, waveform of electricity that this sound is, quote, the waveform of electricity running through your home, well, then one has fallen prey to a Zionist deception. The humming, quote, is the sound of buildings talking, something that he first notices in his family's apartment that only he hears. As he sits on the floor attempting to draw his apartment building, the humming becomes louder and turns into a voice. Madame Bill's it says, I am there. My tongue sounds as mortal hands lay cornerstones at Katum, Asukra, and Al Aqsa. When your father whisses, whispers Adhan and the Amma in your ears, so too am I there. I speak before your birth as you grow within the womb. I am always, I am the voice of stone and earth. The voice of the buildings follows him here through his lifetime, save when he is flying in an airplane. Ultimately, it is the transcendent voice of the buildings that is the source of the inspiration and his insanity. He has heard the buildings speak, but he has never heard the voice of God. The mirror is an architectural, not a religious fanatic. Well, um, in the book's 15th chapter, a mirror travels with fellow conspirator Ziad Jarrah, where they are taken to a secret compound and meet Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden describes the plot, and Amir initially finds it to be outlandish until bin Laden names his target. Okay, this one.
right? There's high rises and high rises, the mid century assault, Minoru Yamasaki's children, the twin abominations. Clearly, targeting the W, the World Trade Center Tower, speaks directly to Amir's bet noir the, of the urban landscape, the skyscraper. The choice of targets is more meaningful to Amir than either Ben Laden or Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. As Amir sits in his seat awaiting the takeoff of American Airlines Flight 11, he thinks not of paradise, but of Yamasaki's work, quote, in the high modern style, the ultimate disciple of the Couvoisier in the great Satan, an American brutalist. His most notable commissions are the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center and the Pruitt Ego housing projects in St. Louis, Missouri. 33 near identical high rises. The housing project is a self-conscious experiment in the practice of architecture and social planning, an attempt to inflict clean lines of orderliness not only on the buildings themselves, but on the citizens within. As Amir notes, Pruitt Ego, completed in 1955, is nothing short of a disaster again, quoting Amir's thoughts on the takeoff of, of, his, of his terroristic flight. The buildings are never at full capacity. The citizens transform these orderly constructions into a de facto ghetto. Crime, murder, rape, abuse, people who live within cement have hearts in stone, lose any sense of ownership. Life inside these boxes, inside another person's artwork, does not ennoble the spirit, destroys it, grinds it down. Yamasaki's building, sheer away humanity, leave only the beast. Amir, in his thoughts, really is doing nothing more than recalling uh, Charles Jenks' assessment, Charles Jenks, the architectural theorist. Uh, his assessment that the death of modernist architecture can be dated from the destruction of Pruitt Ico in 1972. Uh, the destruction began on March 16, 72, less than a year after the completion of the second of the Twin Towers. The clear implication is that Amir conceives of the act he is about to perform, piloting the plane into the North Tower, as existing in continuity with the demolition of Pruitt Ego, which is but a metonymy for Western architectural modernism, something he was so critical of in his master's thesis. There is no remnant, no legacy of Yamasan. To all dust goes human ambition. As Amir, Amir's plane descends towards the North Tower, he again hears the hum of the building. In fact, the last four pages of the narrative, of the narrative repeat the letter Z in upper and lower case, clustered in groups and with spaces. But what appears to be just a hum is actually once again a voice. Again, it is not God speaking. Rather, as Kovac tells an interviewer, there's a repeated pattern of the apparently random grouping of letters that represent the dots and dashes of Morse code, which fell out the beginning of Robert Frost's poem, Fire and Ice, that begins, some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. Section, the next section is titled, Amir Reads Disney. Throughout Ada, Amir attempts to interpret American culture allegorically for the deeper meaning it has for the Islamic world. While still in Germany, viewing the animated film The Jungle Book, which he finds to be thoroughly immoral, particularly the ending in which Mowgli meets a girl drawing water into a jar, um, Amir uh, summarizes for the 9-11 conspirators the, the entire plot of the Jungle Book, explaining its deeper significance. I'll only quote the ending of his, inter of his narrative interpretation. The child now understands that a human cannot be an animal in the jungle. The child realizes his beastly nature will emerge only in a pagan village tolerant of fornication. The child follows the girl into the village. Uh, the child passes through the village gate, sure to make himself a beast. The panther argues lust is paramount to loyalty. The film ends. Later, by chance, while waiting in a doctor's office in the U.S. For, to get a physical, uh, in order to get his pilot's license, Amir happens to see a part of an episode of Tailspin, 
an early 1990s Disney television series that bizarrely repurposes a number of the animal characters from the Jungle Book. Baloo, the bear, plays a cocky cargo pilot from the 1930s who battles air pirates. At a loss to understand the connection between the film, of which he was sure he understood the significance, and the television series, Amir goes to the library and checks out a biography of Walt Disney. The biography does not help. After all, there is absolutely no connection between the movie and the television series. But Amir finds a connection between himself and Disney. Quote, a story repeats itself. A man, or his parents, or his parents' parents come to America. Hard work, toil and obscurity amongst unknown wretches. Great open land. The one who works hardest reaps eventual reward, rises to prominence, achieves great things, makes himself a name. This is also my story, thinks Ada. I am Sa Saeed Khatib. I, too, am an immigrant success. Strikingly, the entire lead-up, he's been obsessing about Walt Disney, and we expect him at this moment to say, I, too, am Walt Disney. But he doesn't. He does not think I am Walt Disney, a man building his magic kingdom in the early 1950s, but rather links himself to a man who, in the early 1950s, was helping to rebuild the former kingdom of Egypt. This seems to be an unconscious slip on Amir's part, because Qutub was no immigrant success story as Amir imagines Disney. Qutub, in fact, was just the opposite. Although he came to study in the US between 1948 and 1950, Qutub did not like what he saw and subsequently rejected the West. An author and Islamic intellectual, Kitab was a prominent member of the Muslim Brotherhood who became disillusioned with the secularism of the post-revolution Egypt uh, government. He was jailed in 1954 for plotting the assassination of Egypt Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser and was executed 12 years later. Kitab's 1964 book, Milestones, which theorizes the steps needed to return the world to a true Islamic rule, which subsequently inspire Al-Qaeda's leadership. What causes Amir to confuse these two men? Reading about Disney, Amir sees himself as another embodiment of the American dream. If Amir is like Disney, a shaper of the American culture of imagination. Since both are immigrant success stories, Amir is also like Kato, a harsh critic of the materialism of this same American culture. What Kobeck seems to play with is the visual similarity of these two men that causes Amir, who has been reading, after all, a biography of Walt Disney that would doubtless have contained pictures of its subject, to uh, unconsciously equate the creator of the Magic Kingdom with an Egyptian political radical who hoped that the fall of the Kingdom of Egypt would result in an Islamic state. Sometimes it pays to follow up on the references in fiction. <laughs> in Amir's unconscious, Walt Disney is Saeed Khatib's evil twin. To the extent that Amir is bullied by the secular warrior father, the young man seeks a surrogate father for him. If imaginatively being Qutub allows Amir to show his father the true path to political Islam, linking himself to Disney allows Amir to believe that his terrorist act may have the same cultural impact as Disney's empire. Amir's obsession with Disney culminates in a moment that has no basis in the archival record. Kobeck imagines Amir going to Disney World shortly before 9-11. The urban planner in Amir can admire the totalizing design of, quote, the airstat streets of the false king city, urban development at its highest levels, dense clusters of shopping. Uh, perfect ordering of the trees, thought and deliberation put into the placement of every brick. A master plan controls each aspect. Amir's visit culminates in Tomorrowland, where he finds, quote, terrifying idols of mid-century modernism. In the circular modernist building housing 
the, carol of, the carousel of progress, where, quote, lifelike idols built to resemble a human family act out the history of American technological dominance. The mirror has an epiphany. Quote, modernist architecture and European sorcery. Walt Disney is dead, but the castle remains his seat of power in a radiating central force that exudes arrogance of vision upon surrounding lands. Tomorrow disconnects from tomorrow land. For whom is this a fantasy? Cultural imperialism of the strangest, strongest kind chips away at interior imagination and the diverse sense of human lives, creeps out from the confines of Disney World, moves into the world, conquers. In Amir's architectural unconscious, then to strike a blow against Yamasaki's modernist towers simultaneously destroys Disney's colonizing modernist vision of an endless future that sustains American hegemony. And one last section, desperately fleeing Scheherazade. Another aspect that separates Ada from other reductive representations of the 9-11 conspirators is a sense that despite Amir's architectural insanity, the narrative does not see Amir's terrorist act as his latent destiny. Kobeck presents a moment in which Amir might have chosen a different path. During his time researching in Aleppo, the historical Ada met regularly with a woman who worked in the city's planning office and who did not wear hijab. Kobeck names her Amal and imagines Amir's conflicted feeling, fascination mixed with disdain for the forwardness of this smart, independent woman. Against his better judgment, he agrees to come to her house for tea. Since Amal's parents left Palestine in the wake of the 1967 Arab Israeli War, he assumes she considers herself a Palestinian and must surely pay Jews, as he and Walt Disney did. Uh, she does neither. Uh, when Amal tells Amir that she is not even sure she considers herself a Muslim any longer, Amir immediately prepares to leave. She stops him, however, by offering to tell him a story. Amir says he wants no idolatry, and Amal promises him an ancient story. The story she tells is comprised of stock characters. Um, Harun al-Rashid, Rashid, the Sultan, his vizier, Jafar, and the head of the Bag Baghdad's guard, Wazir. Uh, these are characters that appear in several stories, including in 1001 Nights, which clearly positions Amal as a Shahrazad figure. As she tells her story, Amir's thoughts interrupt at several points and reveal that Amir is falling in love with Amal. At one point, he notes her delicate hands and the beauty, and the beauty that requires no adornment. Amal's story involves a genie of the ring who grants gift of time travel to the one whom Allah has selected. The Sultan charges Jafar to find the man worthy of this gift. When, the man, when, when he cannot find the man, Jafar throws the ring out the window where it is found by uh, Wazir, whom the genie then informs it's the chosen one. Wazir wishes to return to the evening of his marriage when his wife is raped and murdered. The genie grants the request but warns that if Wazir changes the past very much, he may not recognize the present when he returns. In the past, Wazir discovers that it is Jafar who is about to commit the crime and kills the evil Vizier. Wazir, Vizier, Vizier, Wazir then calls out to the genie to return him to the present. At this key plot moment, Amal breaks off her story with a smile. Amar, Amir is clearly fascinated with both the story and the storyteller. Quote, she looks at my face. I wish my face better. I wish to present Amal with a better face. He asks Amal what has happened, what happens when Wazir returns to the present. However, Amal says that she is tired and must sleep, but offers to finish the story if he returns the next evening. He readily promise, promises to do so, but instead leaves Aleppo and never sees Amal again. Against his sexual and narrative desire, then, Amir metaphorically kills his Shinozah. This metafictional story within a story comments on the larger novel. As is the case in Wazir's life, Amir's contains more than one possible outcome. If Amal tells the story of how Wazir's changing the past will surely impact the present, Kovac suggests that Amir's act of terrorism was not inevitable, that Amir might easily have chosen differently and turned his story into one of domestic bliss, 
with him and Abal working together to attempt to re recreate the Islamic golden age in Aleppo. This path not taken, the very one that Amir in fact seems to be choosing as he takes his leave of Abal, shows, as does Abal's unfinished story, how multiple futures reside in our present. I would conclude by simply reminding us that Frederick Jameson opened his famous study of postmodernism by claiming that concepts serve, quote, as an attempt to think the present historically in an age that has forgotten how to think historically in the first place. By insisting on the importance of architectural history to an understanding of the utopian desires and terroristic imagination of Mohammed, Mohammed El Amir El Said Atta, Kobeck's novel proffers a beneficially postmodern invitation to think historically and serves, along with Jess Walters the Zero, as a reminder that not all American 9-11 fiction explores white middle-class marital woes at the expense of confronting the Islamic government. Thank you. So, um, I'll let uh, Dr. Duvall handle his own questions. He can moderate for himself. He seems capable. That's a good part. <laughs> Very interesting, John. Uh, I, um, I guess my question concerns the difference between the, uh, the Codex and the uh, approach to this. Uh, it, it, it seems to me it's very clear that, that what you have said, and I like very much the approach that, that, that Codex is suggesting it's a kind of repetition of what he's been doing all along. This is a part of a demolition, this is part of a, a project of engaging in an architectural renewal. It, it's, it's, it's not significantly different. Than that. It's not, he's not simply following orders. This is what he's been part of. That makes a lot of sense. How does the Amos story uh, make sense in, in that context, or does it? Well, that, yeah, yeah. yeah, and this is what, what I'm saying is I was trying to use uh, Kovacs as just to say, here's a, here's a kind of quantum leap ahead yeah. okay. of fictional okay. thinking about, yeah. um, about terrorism. That, that so many of the narratives, as I say, the Lilo's terrorists are just, he tries, but yeah. his, his Muhammad Adda just comes across as not three-dimensional at all. It's just it's very thin. Uh, and then you, the other, uh, you know, it's so easy to uh, do what, what Amos did and, and uh, yeah. turn it into some kind of you know, revenge fantasy. Yeah, right, right, right. So, the, so we was set up precisely to contrast. Yes, okay. that, was, that was that was okay. That was part of it. Yes. Oh, thank you. That was that was really, especially tracing back the Kutzov's uh, analogy. Uh, my question: I was I was um, captured by a sentence you used at the beginning of your talk, where you said uh, you you basically said there's there's no example, a perfect example of a 9-11 narrative. Should, should there be a one? Because uh, in my estimation, it's good that we don't have one, because we, we don't want it to be, we're still looking for more works on that, on this subject. Well, I think what the, part of the problem is, is that um, the general consensus is most of the narratives of 9-11 have fallen short of expectations. Mm -hmm. And Particularly, and I think it's true that, uh, that a lot of the fiction that um, tries to address the day directly ends up looking at the impact on particular New Yorkers, particularly how it affects the family. Jonathan Safford Forbes, extremely loud, incredibly colors, you know, the son's trauma over the loss of his father. Um, you know, and, and so it's all, and that's Gray's complaint, that it's always, the trauma is always domesticated. And, uh, and, and but the point, my point is, it's like wait a minute, there's some narratives here that critics don't credit, and that's precisely the these postmodern narratives um, of 9/11, like Jess Walters, the Zero, and like Codex Ave, um, that really could complicate quite a bit the discussion, and that's really all I was trying to get. But no, I mean, no, I mean. Anything we say about what the 9 11 novel ought to do or is will immediately be complicated the, uh, next week when the new 9 11 novel is published. And that, yeah, that's always the problem with any 
to attempt to theorize, here is what the 9-11 novel does. You know, well, just wait until the novelist publishes something new. Um, thank you for the talk. I found the bit about the um, MA thesis or the MS thesis in architecture really, really interesting. So that thesis does actually exist. It actually exists. Um, I found it, one, I don't know if you would know much about this, but so I apologize. Um, but first comment, I thought it was interesting that, um, I mean, I would think that somebody would have gone to get a copy of this um, for purposes of trials or research into, I mean, I, I mean, I have to believe that some covert oper um, operation has been into this office, picked the lock, actually got <laughs> it, and put a dummy copy in there, but um, do you know anything, I mean, uh, beyond just um, fear of sort of legal, um, yeah, legal repercussions, why that hasn't been made um, available by a larger, more global legal well, yeah, and I, and I think, you know, in the days after 9-11, you, you have um, some journalistic accounts that make reference to it, and uh, but quickly dismiss it as just being a sidebar, um, not, you know, well, isn't it interesting that, and, uh, or that um, sources that were, were familiar with it say that there's nothing really of interest there in that thesis. And then to follow up to that, I was wondering and curious, uh, I was curious in terms of the narrative, so um, did, um, is it, it's Kobeck, right, the author Kobeck? Yeah. Um, has he said anything about, um, I mean, let's say that that were available, do you, uh, this is sort of a speculative question, but do you think that he would have been more willing to actually take three pages from the, from the text itself? I mean, do you think that uh, in your reading of the novel, would that have any effect on the end or, or the purpose that he thought that that last section was serving? If it was from the actual thesis itself, does it seem to be, I mean, does it fit sort of his metafictional purposes better to create this document? Well, I think it does because it, it shows us what fiction can do that history uh, pretends like it doesn't do but often does anyway, which is that there is an archive and but nevertheless, what do you do when the archive is, is an absence or a blank or, or you, you're denied access to the archive? Uh, so that, yeah, no, when I first read this, and I came and I turned from the last chapter, and I was like, holy smoke, he's gotten a hold of the thesis. You know, and that was, but, and, and, and of course I became interested, like, well, where can I find the rest of it? I, I don't want just a three-page excerpt, I want to see the whole thing. And then immediately I found the, the roadblock uh, that not accessible, um, you know. And we more inaccessible than if you just put uh, you know, mark on your dissertation, not for uh, I forget what the there's some what's it called not for public uh, dispersal or you know, I say sometimes doing the sciences. <laughs> There's some wording you can keep it out of circulation. And is there a, is there just this one moment of sort of indicting the uh, the reader into the text, or is that something that he works out throughout it? And what you mean, you mean the, the address when he addresses the reader and sort of implicates them? Um, and what what's the sort of significance of that one moment? like uh, from your just general reading? Again, it's, it's one of those things that I think that might not initially strike you, but on rereading to realize that the, the text constructs its ideal reader quite literally as a member as a, a member of the 9-11 terrorist cell, that this is the, the story that Ada is telling to his co-conspirators to inspire them um, to I, I think it's um, you know interesting. I mean, every text constructs its ideal reader uh, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, even even our essays that we write uh, to construct that. Reader. So, um, but uh, I did, did, what did you think of that? Of that just? I mean, it's an interesting ploy, given that the ideal reader constructed by the text is certainly not really going to be the one reading it. So. It, I mean, 
I would like to think of moments like that, and you know, this is something that I think fiction ought to do, to be almost a kind of sympathetic, like to try and really to get you to imagine and to put yourself in that to place. Imagine the other. Right, to, to imagine the other, which may be an impossible task, but one that nevertheless ought to be tried and maybe ought to be tried even more when it's this kind of controversial and, and troubling sort of thing for people, which I'm sure when, when someone who's reading that who might not be into literature or who might be more of sort of a lay person given the political situation in the United States right now might really be jarred by that. And, and this is what so much fiction does. It puts the terrorist outside of the human community. That they, they that their 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 act was so unspeakable, so um, so terrible that you know you read something like uh, uh, Bejbade's Windows on the World. You know he he, he bemoaned there he is in France, uh, sitting in a tower, trying to get a sense of what it would be like to have a plane come at him. And, um, Almost expels the terrorist from the human community. Um, I just wanted to respond to this conversation that that address a uh, brother that uh, uh, or Edmure uses throughout the book. Like, not only is it yes. bringing the community in there, but he's talking as a martyr to his followers. Right. So I read somewhere a psychological study that people who committed suicide always sort of imagine the repercussions of their suicide. Either like people are sorrowful or they can think about them or they're regretful. So for a martyr, you have to imagine there has to be a stronger connection between giving your life for some religious cause. So to me, that reading the book, that addressed brother made total sense to me. Like a martyr is, of course, always talking to the people that come come after, right? You're, that's the connection between the transcendent world and the, the real world, too, like once you're in that space of being a martyr. And, and the but for him, though, what he's preaching, though, at that moment, that first time, is not, you know, faith in Allah, but the transcendent voice of the buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, his architectural insanity or fundamentalism. Um, where, where, does, where does Kovacs leave us ethically? I feel like it's following up with your, your question. I mean, he's, he's vastly complexifying. Uh, and in a particularly interesting way, I mean, you know, this idea that this is an elaborate repetition it really makes us, gives us access to the other. Okay, that seems to be stage one, is access to the other. But then what happens with the question of either the ethical and the political uh, as a result of that? Does, does that get broached in the book? Well, you know, I mean, you know, the character, or, you know, it's not going to be what is off the book, and, and, and the, I'm not imagining him as, uh, as human, and yet it does cast him as um, you know, insane. Yeah. You know, I mean, he, it's an insanity that uh, you know, he hears voices. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. but at the same time, uh, it imagines a very different kind that it does not have to be religious fundamentalism. Uh, Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes. uh, I have another follow-up to that, a question about this fundamentalism, the architectural insanity. Another point you mentioned that is a reactionary, reactionary vision. Um, but I I had a lot more sympathy, and maybe I'm just more of a potential terrorist than you are, so that's coming out or something. <laughs> you know, but, oh, his critiques are, you know, you, 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 at times you read his critiques of of uh, the West, and you know, it's like I've I've heard these before, you know. It's just like, and as he, and we've talked about it. Yeah, yeah. And, and some of his, I, I happen to have my notes here from reading. At one point, he says, "Why are buildings built? For what purpose? To house people or to harvest money for those who believe they can own the land?" So that resonates with me, and I don't think it's reactionary in the sense that the reactionary is a return to the past for the past sake. But he's looking to the essences. And in another scene, he talks about the courtyards in Aleppo, I think. And then they build these high rises, and families can no longer enjoy it. Right. Their families will look down into these courtyards, the courtyards and see the women. So that's not, to me, reactionary. That's the essence of a dwelling as a home, is to have a private place where you live for a reason to go about your life and to live. Um, and if the, if the root of your community is, you know, you know, he's willing to grant that, OK, let's, let's found an organic community on 
Islamic law, okay, if that's our given, what, what needs to happen? Uh, and, and, and of course, the high rise is an intrusion because the privacy of the family's women is violated by the high rise, which allows people to see down into the courtyard. So if, if it wasn't for him hearing the buzzing, hearing the singing in the building, to, like that is insane, right? That's, something's going on there. But if it wasn't for that device, what he's actually saying about his kind of architecture versus modern architecture, do you still think his reactionary are the same? No, or no, I mean, as I said, I, I tried to make the point is that, that it, it, it's, uh, he speaks a criticism that is pretty much standard mm -hmm. uh, you know, from, from Jacobs to Jenks uh, about modern, you know, the failures of modernist architecture, the totalizing impulses of modernist architecture. You saw uh, you know, that, that horror show of, of, of I mean, here, here, is, here is the dream of modernist architecture. You know, we'll all put people in little boxes and won't that be wonderful? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we clear out, boom, we level a number of square blocks of, uh, of a decaying part of the city, uh, despite the character that it had, and we'll put up repetition, sameness, and, and sameness is good. And you can sort of like see like, oh, no wonder he put up Twin Towers. Yeah. I have a follow-up and then I have a question. Regarding the Islamic laws of architecture, it's not only because a woman, the minute that a neighbor has access to, to his neighbor's house, it's, it's not permissible, just by that moment itself. And uh, the neighbor has the right to sue and have that removed, whatever overlooking thing, balcony, whatever, that has to be removed because it's a violation of privacy. It doesn't matter what I'm there or not. The, my question is this. Uh, I, I, I wonder if you're familiar with, the, if you know the work um, by uh, Amy Waldman, uh, the submission. Yes. Uh, I read I read a review on a New York Times review on, on the book that I'm, I'm about to buy. I haven't even read the book yet, but it's the there is a blind um, a design bidding for building uh, the towers. Of, I mean the, the replace. Yes. Right. And then a Muslim wins. Uh, uh, the Betty, and his name is Muhammad, again, Muhammad Khan, but he's a secular Muslim. He, he doesn't even believe in Islam, but he has this name. And, right. and this, I mean, causes the dilemma in the novel itself. But uh, I wonder if you could, because of the architecture and the architect, and if you could, uh, you know, enlighten us. Yeah, it, 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 that's uh, certainly an interesting novel, but it is, uh, and actually, it's uh, one of the better realist novels, I think, of 9-11. If there's a downside to it, it is a little preachy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just sort of like, um, you know, shame on all you people, you know, who uh, the thought, you, thought you could judge uh, architecture uh, outside of any context, but then see how your prejudices rear their ugly heads when you learn the identity of the winning architect. And, uh, you know, and people having to confront their prejudices and, you know, so it's it's um, as if, you know, almost as if she's channeling Sinclair Lewis. Yeah, when when uh, nine eleven hit, um, Rene Girard was interviewed in, in uh, Le Monde, and what he said about Ada was that he, what he what struck him was the westernized conceptualization that Ada himself uh, seemed to embody. I'm, I, I'm think, I was thinking as you were talking, John, of the end of Othello in Aleppo once where Malignan and the Turk and Turk uh, uh, beat a Venetian and, and uh, uh, introduced the state. I took by the throat the circumcised dog and slew him thus, which is a, an act of, of self-destruction. If, 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 I guess my question is, is there an, is, is Quebec's echoing to some extent in Aleppo once, that, that ending, a famous ending? And if so, doesn't that place him like as as it does uh, Othello for Shakespeare as uh, within a Western notion? That is to say, here is this foreigner coming in who is working for the state and actually engages in an act of suicide. It, and does it, it continues the complexifying uh, of, of the moment, but it, but identifies him as, as operating within a you know an identifiably Western perspective. In, in that case, Shakespeare's. If we can. 
And of course, to a certain extent, uh, Otto's Western appearance is a, a ruse. I mean, that all yeah. the, they, they shaved their beards, they, right. they, you know, they wore Western clothes, so as not to draw attention to themselves. And, uh, uh, but I love the suggestion about the connection to Othello, and I'll have to, I frankly have to think about that a bit more. It's been a while since I. <laughs> I'm, I'm just teaching the semesters. That's yeah. why. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a great suggestion. You need to This sort of a genre or literary movement question. As you know, I, I'm somewhat critical of postmodernism generally, and my my heart goes out to modernism a lot. Uh, how do you sort of situate the earnestness of something like this? Like how serious this, I mean part of what I have a problem with sometimes with postmodernism is that sort of the meta work that goes on, the, the wordplay and the language games always feels like it's like just a wink and a nod. Like the reader's always being like, yeah sure the reader's implicated, but it's implicated in such a way that like, oh this is like Faulkner and Absalom Absalom and, and, and those sorts of things. When I see the reader being implicated, it's just a more like, it feels to me more like an earnest questioning. And with this, it seems like the playfulness and the problematic stuff you were pointing to in the sort of comedic clownish buffoon rendering of Otto in the short story, but this seems much more sort of earnest and serious, like, and then identifying the reader as a potential member and co-conspirator and all of this. And well, and I think it's that strain. There's a difference between just a, a ludic postmodernism that you know is involved in, as you say, the wordplay, the not the wink, the John Barth kind of metafiction, um, as opposed to uh, the kind of the, that uh, Linda Hutchin called historiographic metafiction. That there's sort of there's a whole tradition of novels going going back to novels like uh, E. L. Doctorow's The Book of Daniel, which becomes a retelling of the Rosenberg execution, but from a very metafictional uh, standpoint of the imagining the, the son you know, working on his dissertation instead of writing his dissertation, writes the history of his family, but often in the language of. of Using conventions and at times of the dissertation of the historian moving between first and third person. Um, so I think there is a, a kind of metafiction that has the, the seriousness, mm -hmm. uh, as you like, um, um, yeah, that, that uh, I think often some of my favorite to Willow um, has, like, like Underworld, mm -hmm. that incredible opening that takes place at the baseball game, the, the, uh, the uh, Dodgers and the Giants, the third deciding game of the 1951 playoff where J. Edgar Hoover is at the game and, and uh, he learns from an agent that the Soviets have detonated their second nuclear device. Well, it leads to a historical, again, where if you think about it, you realize, oh, you know, what does this mean? Uh, that a day that's significant to the history of the Cold War is only remembered for its uh, importance in the history of baseball when uh, Bobby Thompson hits the shot heard around the world, overlooking, overshadowing the, so the Soviets' nuclear shot, right? That here's a day that essentially in stage be that officially begins the Cold War because now U.S. intelligence has the, knows that the Soviets have the bomb, okay? And, and so, I mean, DeLillo, it's, it's, it's playful, but it's also historicized in a way that makes us kind of go back and look at what it is we've missed in history. And I think that so that if you, that kind of marriage of historiography and metafiction is a strain of, in the postmodern that you would like. Mm -hmm. um, so a little bit of a follow-up to that. Uh, a few of us went to see uh, Terry Eagleton talk uh, at uh, Purdue Calumet and he had a sort of a bit about postmodernism that now after 9-11, uh, the West is faced with this like monolithic meta-narrative, <laughs> right? Like uh, the West is faced with this, with this fundamentalism that has this sort of absolute meta-narrative to it. And postmodernism, of course, is the famous, you know, incredulity toward meta-narratives and all that. And that's what enables some of this play playfulness and even some of the history, uh, the, the, what you're talking about with uh, Underworld. So um, 
so what does what does the now like injection of this content of 9/11 do for postmodernism? You know what I'm saying? Like uh, yeah. with that confrontation between this. I hope it turns the kaleidoscope just a quarter of a turn. Uh -huh. Does the pattern fall out just a little differently? That you know this uh, meta narrative of Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, well, maybe, but maybe also something else mm -hmm. for this particular character, this particular terrorist, Muhammad Ana. It seems like it really draws, I mean, because then it throws that meta narrative into question. Right? And that's what I think, uh, too, like Just Walters the Zero, very playful um, narrative um, that calls into question the claims that um, various agencies like the FBI have made about keeping us safe from future terrorist assaults after 9 11 by constructing plots that entrap people who would otherwise never be interested in terrorism. I mean, that, that, I mean Walter's novel takes that premise and takes it to its extreme where he imagines a terrorist cell in which every terrorist is an informant for a different government agency. Right? Um, and at the, at the end, of the climactic moment, all the agencies converge, all the informants are killed, but they treat it as like a great victory in the war against terror. Yeah. I mean, there's a postmodernism that has some pretty serious, and it, it, it critiques our meta narrative of the homeland security state. You know, who do we need to be secure from? Maybe the agencies that are constructing that security apparatus. Uh, we have time for maybe another question or so, but if everyone, uh, or, or you know, beer, yeah, or <laughs> beer, <laughs> I think we'll leave it on that exact note right there. <laughs> so thank you. Uh,